just living on the normal life day to day. Yeah, I met a New Zealand and she said to me, oh, so you are a coloured? So I said, excuse me? Where do you, may, might I ask, would, would, would you tell me where, you, where did you get to hear of that term? And she says, no, because this white South African uh, said there's a lot of coloured people here. Oh my gosh. And I said, excuse me, can I just um, educate you on that? That's a derogatory term, and mm. I actually do take offence. I'm a person of colour or a brown person. And I was actually taken aback. I must also say something about the Afrikaner people that moved from South Africa uh, to New Zealand. They still carry their racist views from there over to this country. I'm Sarai. And I'm Julie. This year, we travelled with our Soundy Joey across Aotearoa to eavesdrop on immigrant whānau talking with their children. Every family we visited welcomed us, made us laugh, honestly made us cry. And over this series, we invite you too to listen in on Conversations with My Immigrant Parents. On this episode, we meet Tammy and their parents Derek and Lynette, who migrated from South Africa to Tamaki Makoto in 2003. Derek came to New Zealand first. He was here for five months alone, working two jobs to prepare for his family's arrival. He told us that he would get up at 8am and work till 6pm, and then he'd work again from 11pm to 6am before starting his 8am job again. Derek also learnt Māori for a year after he came. He's of Khoisan heritage, which is an indigenous tribe of South Africa, so he also has indigenous whakapapa as well. Tammy's non-binary, which they'll talk about later on in the episode, but you will notice Derek and Lynette referring to Tammy as their daughter and using she, her pronouns. We also wanted to highlight that within the last 10 minutes of the episode, we touch on issues of mental health that Tammy's experienced, including depression and anxiety. This discussion is detailed and emotional, so we're flagging it now in case listening to these darker moments might be hard for any of our listeners. So let's hear from the Solomons. My parents are Lynette and Derek Solomon. They were both born in Cape Town, South Africa, and I think we lived there... 2002 or 2003. My dad is one of the most friendliest, kindest people. And so is my mom. She just takes a bit more warming up (laughs) too. But they're very welcoming and understanding. Tamsin is our middle child and she was born in 1991 in Cape Town, South Africa. She's very soft-hearted, very artistic, and um, she's also very outspoken, uh, very intelligent. Anything you can add? Yes, she's a caring, loving person. She loves nature, animals. Um, Family is important to her. Yeah, she was also um, always very interested in what I was doing. You know, she would help me if I was fixing a car or ask me, Dad, can I do something, you know, and I'll just give her some directions what to do, and then that's how she always became involved uh, with me. I've kept a diary since I came. It was just about how I travelled to New Zealand and my first journey when I came here. When I actually got onto the plane, it didn't dawn on me yet that what I was actually doing, I mean, I had made the decision. But when the plane sort of just touched down, I knew there was no turning back. And then I thought to myself, have I ever done the right thing? Um, And at that point in time, I didn't know whether I had a job or not. How was looking for a job here? Was it easy, difficult? Uh, It helped in a way when I, I mean, I made some connections with people that were South African and uh, they gave me leads to some companies. And like the usual thing, you go for the interviews and you get promises and you think you're getting the job and then it doesn't happen. So being alone, leaving you guys all behind in South Africa, 
feeling almost like you're going into a dark room. You don't know, know. what you're going to expect on the other side. But Gosh, because and, uh, yeah. Dad also had a connection with a, a friend. Yeah. Um, yes, that was an interesting part. In 1976 or even 74, we had a newspaper called the Cape Herald. At that time, it was like a, a skinner current, like a, a tabloid or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so, um, and that was the in thing. There was no internet, there was nothing like that. So I managed to look in the, at the back of the newspaper and I saw pen friends from New Zealand. And I looked, wow, and, I looked and I looked and I saw there was one lady that caught, caught my eye and her name was Donna Hamilton. So I started to write letters to Donna. Um, Were you already dating mom by then or was that before that? Uh, no, that was Way at school. Before. I was still at school. No, you were still at time. school. I was still at school oh, at the right. time. But we, we all wanted to have a, a white girlfriend <laughs> as a pen friend or something like that because we couldn't have white girlfriends in our country. So. So that was the opportunity. So I wrote this letter. I said, okay, I'm going to choose this one from New Zealand. Anyway, wrote a letter. Then uh, she started to reply. And so we had this sort of um, thing going. So as it turned out, when I on my way to uh, New Zealand, I sent her an email and I didn't know whether she was going to get it to tell her that I was on my way. But they have been in contact. You never yes. stopped uh, contact yes, so I always since nineteen seventy six. About so thirty odd years, your dad yeah. was in contact with Donna. O- wow. I always in contact with Donna. Yeah, when emails came in, they were used to email. So I think that could have um, also influenced mm. um, our decision to move to New Zealand. So uh, Donna mm. took me for my first interview. Donna Hamilton married O'Grady, so we became Donna O'Grady. So she actually met. We met for the first time in Albany. Uh, over lunch and then um, she took me for my first interview and then I got the job at Bull Tapper European. So it was really good to meet her after all those years, um, you know, that we've kept in contact. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah and I also remember that there was a postcard or something she sent, uh, they call it a postcard letter, something like you fold it up with different pictures on it, like Raiki Island. Uh, the harbour bridge, and I always wanted to grab over the harbour bridge <laughs> because it's in the photo. I always, uh, yeah, I didn't realise the traffic was going to be so heavy. So, anyway. yeah, of, yeah, yeah, I always dreamed. This dream was driving over Auckland Harbour Bridge, and that dream was realised. And, you know, it was always like, oh, you know, I can't believe I'm driving on the harbour bridge. It's, um, yeah, that this dream has been realised. And... You know, as we lived in, we had to travel from the North Shore over the Harbour Bridge every day. It was like, oh, this bridge is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's, yeah um, we always um, joke about that. So really, the Solomons wouldn't have ended up here in New Zealand if it wasn't for Donna Hamilton. I really like how they talked about how their dream turned into a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. The vision of New Zealand that was presented not being exactly full what of that traffic. Was. <laughs> uh, we also wanted to ask the Solomons about their reasons for leaving South Africa. So basically, uh, for me, the decision was uh, not an easy one. I think post '94, when Nelson Mandela said he had this concept of a rainbow nation, and everybody. F- was free, they felt good about the country. But the years that followed and Mandela stepped down, then that concept sort of faded away a bit. And it and kind of went the other way, didn't it? Yeah, like, and then we had a new system, um, affirmative action. So affirmative action is basically when they employ more black people into jobs. So what basically happened in my job uh, was that there was no more room for growth there. And I could see that, you know, it's it, the future didn't look too good for me job-wise. So I had a discussion, you know, my, your mom and myself, and we said, look, I, I don't have 20 years uh, to waste in this country. Um, as uh, your dad has said, we were all waiting and thinking, you know, um, this is something we've always looked forward to and yearned for. 
But this wasn't what Nelson Mandela wanted. No. It wasn't his dream. No, not at all. And uh, then it was almost like um, black domination. And we were, again, in the middle. And we felt that, no, um, we're going to go through this and let our children go through this again. And, I mean, people accused me of, uh, you know, running away mm. from the country. But I wasn't doing it for them. I was just doing it for my family. I was doing it for you guys. That was a decision I had to make. And with the blessing of my mom, that was enough. Mm. She said, go. And then the crime also. Um, and then it was yes. calm. Yes, you Lots of crime. crime. And uh, when that little girl in Autry um, disappeared from home and her grandmother left her at the gate and went inside to fetch a jumper. Um, she came out and the nine-year-old had disappeared. And I know your dad was in New Zealand and I thought, oh, I'm alone with these children and it's this country, is, it's so violent here now. You know, after a while, people have obtained their freedom and everybody was like, what do we do now? You know, and it's just, we're free to do anything. And um, that is just natural, you know, reaction mm. that people react. And, uh, yeah, she disappeared, and her body was found a few days later. And mm. I thought, you know, this is, ooh, so close oh. to home. So as Lynette mentioned, 1994 was when apartheid was abolished, but, of course, everyone in South Africa still felt the effects of it, and... Coming out of a regime like that was difficult in so many ways, something that I think we can hear mm. in the way that Lynette refers to black domination, which is a difficult thing to listen to and a difficult thing to imagine. Mm. Yeah, I think we also felt that way when she talked about, she mentioned the phrase reverse apartheid, which <laughs> I think was just so jarring for us to hear because just having not lived in that context, it's hard for us to judge that. Mm. Um, but they also talked about in South Africa having such a rigid classification system for race on identity documents. You were either black or coloured or white. There's like a whole list of numbers. And for the Solomons not fitting entirely within blackness or whiteness, that was really difficult for them, both within apartheid and post-apartheid. If you're at the very bottom, you know, one year, a couple of years is never going to undo or erase that. Mm. Um and at the end of the day as well, the only people who really thrived in any context in South Africa were white South Africans. Obviously, the image that was presented to the family of New Zealand was an idea of refuge. Even though we know here in New Zealand, of course, we have extremely high rates of domestic violence mm -hmm. and racist abuse. Um, we saw that on March 15th with Christchurch, that the sense of safety is just a facade. It's not real. Mm. Or it's something that only a few New Zealanders perceive anyway. Mm. Like certain New Zealanders will feel safe and probably still feel safe even after March 15th, whereas a lot of people who didn't feel safe before feel even less safe now. In terms of personal contact that I've had, I have met a New Zealander who very much upfrontly was like... Um, you shouldn't be here, um, and, like, this is meant to be a white people's place. And that was like, you know, what the heck? And turns out that neo-Nazism is still a rife thing in New Zealand. And I still remember when it was happening, the Christchurch shooting, because I was online then when I found out. I felt terrified. I, like, called you guys and everything, and, like... We were so on edge because this was not meant to happen in New Zealand. Like, we escaped that yeah. um, hatefulness towards people being different. And we all thought that. And so when that happened, it just gave us all, like, a really, really big shock that someone would go and do that. And people keep saying, you know, this is not our New Zealand. It's like, no, it is. It, it's just finally bubbled to the surface because everyone who is, like, Asian, like, person of colour, black, you know, they, they get these, like, either looks or this side remarks from people of, like, oh, no, it's another immigrant. In the back of my mind, we always 
knew that there was something was going to happen because I yeah we all that, felt that I always thought that New Zealand was too complacent in certain way we had mm. this, um, you know that they they I mean it until afterward they said they were looking in the wrong area where yeah. threat was most probably coming from but uh, that was a shock uh, for, for myself mm. but on the other hand uh, just talking about uh, experiencing racism so a lot of people say, you know they, they don't want to believe that there's any racism here but there is so with experience and you know our neighbour our favourite oh neighbour oh my god had, oh no I we, remember um, him far too he, well where he used to throw things uh, uh, in our driveway and he used to um, you know abuse and, and tell us to go well at least tell me to, to go back to your country to F mm. beep <laughs> to your, off to your country, <laughs> you know, go to your country, you know, and all those things. And it was it was very really sad. Uh, of three years of, of um, when I had to endure lots of um, things being uh, sabotage mm-hmm. um, and things like that. And, and the, the, the worst part was when he actually went to the neighbor across the road and he asked the neighbor, what is the worst name you can call this guy that lives next to me? And and the, and the South African neighbor told him and said, "Him, you call him a kaffir." Oh, now, now, yeah. um, to to call somebody a kaffir in South Africa now, you can get a jail term Can't. up to three years, because it, it it's a derogatory term. It's one of and, the and, worst and just derogatory the fact terms. That my, that my neighbor was a Kiwi, um, wanted went to know as, that went as far as to go and inquire about that made me very angry and it and I felt you know I knew you know the right I knew it was a racist but um I, I just I just thought no that know, that it, is it really, disgusting behavior uh yeah it, it really did it just didn't make me feel good because I thought you know I left all that behind you know it was in the distant past and here's somebody next to me right next to me telling me to Go back to your country. Uh, you're a kaffir. Uh, this all and all those names. So I thought, you know, it, it it made me a little bit disillusioned, you know, in mm. terms of uh, New Zealand being the almost a near perfect near place. Near perfect place, you, yeah. But I think just the mere fact that we were the only brown family that moved into that little quiet street. Yeah, the, the best street <laughs> the in The best street in Bergda. Yeah. <laughs> I think he didn't like that so mm-hmm. much. And uh, yeah. and and I think maybe we were And we, because we were homeowners? Yeah. So so that that maybe I think mm-hmm. was part of part of it. But anyway, I mean it was three hard years. I even went to the human rights, I went to the, the police. police. I remember the police all that. wouldn't do anything. <laughs> um, I had all concrete evidence that is sabotaging me, that's putting all kinds of things in my driveway. Oh, this makes me so angry. I think that Derek touched on something really key here, which is when um, white people perceive people of colour as coming up to their level. Mm. You know, they moved on to the best street in Birkdale. They owned their home. Mm. That's like people don't even understand why that pisses them off, you know. I think it's also an example of how institutional racism works. Like Mm. they went to the police and Mm. the police wouldn't do anything. Mm. And New Zealand at the moment doesn't record hate crimes at all. Um, So these things can't be tracked if they're increasing and that's an example of how things like Christchurch happens mm. because you don't track these very angry, violent people who can end up doing something really terrible. And, and they've then, shown signs exactly. that they will do something terrible. And then when something terrible happens, people are like, oh, we had no idea. How mm. could this possibly happen? But all the signs were there. Just living on the normal life day to day. Yeah, I uh, met a... Uh, New Zealand, and she said to me, uh, oh, so you are a coloured? So I said, excuse me? Where do you, may, might I ask, would, would, would you tell me where, you, where did you get to hear of that term? And she says, no, because this white South African uh, said there's a lot of coloured people here. Oh, my gosh. Mm. And I said, excuse me, can I just um, educate you on that? And I gave her a little, you know, um, like you don't talk about the, refer to us as colored. I, that's a derogatory term, and mm. I actually do take offense. Some 
so-called people that call themselves colored don't, but I don't use that term. I'm a person of color or a brown person. Mm. So that's just what I want to say. And I was actually taken aback that um, 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 White I'm, New Zealander I'm, asked me. Yeah, you know, I, I must also say that, I, I must also say something about the expats that came here from, uh, a lot of people don't know, is that a lot of the Africana people that moved from South Africa uh, to New Zealand, they still carry have, that racism. They, they still carry the racist views from the over to this country, and that is very sad, very sad. And um, there was one incident that happened in Browns Bay, where um, a black person received a letter, um, a note, basically in his letterbox, asking him. Uh, in Afrikaans, it says, "Kafir bad dunye and diland," which means, if you translate that meaning, uh, "black person," you know, what are you doing in New Zealand? That was what the note said, you know, basically. So, and just to point out that Browns Bay is basically sort of the small South Africa white for the white the... people. So basically, we have now uh, you can call it the white flight from South Africa. Even within the South African community in New Zealand, I still feel it's divided like there's still the Afrikaners mm. and there's still the coloreds like mm. um even though like in New Zealand it's like oh are you South African it's like yes and then you look at another South African and then we look completely different and I feel especially at some function and everything there's still that little bit of unsure and sometimes tension yeah. um is that about but right dad so how yeah. would you say in uh if when we get together and uh, because we belong to the um, South African community in, in New Zealand. Yes, I remember going South to one Afri of the functions yes, for us. And we get to meet um, lots of Afrikaners who are the driving force maybe behind their organization, the South African group. Um, what do you think we feel speaking to these people? Like on equal, because in South Africa, um, 40 years of my life, I always used to... Uh, be downcast, but you know, and speak. Like, but yeah, I actually I don't experience that. I feel I'm on par. Oh. So, if we meet somebody that's uh, from South Africa and he discovers that you may be a lecturer or you um you know you work in a higher position than them, then they sort of don't want to sort of really associate. They'll greet you, but because they feel a little bit that inferior. you know inferior because. In South Africa, they were at the top, mm -hmm. and and we were at the bottom. Must be a relief. I mean, I really like what Lynette says about here. She feels like she's on par. Mm. I think it's like a lot of people here don't realise when people come from one nationality, one country, that they carry with them all the baggage mm. of the different inequities that come with that country. Like here, with white and POC South Africans, but also in other countries like the caste system with South Asian countries. For sure. I had, I had, there was only one other Sri Lankan boy at my high school mm -hmm. and I told my gran about him one day and I told my gran his full name and without even taking a breath, my gran said, Fisher cast. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, okay. And she, I was like, what are we? She's like, we're farmer cast. And I was like, like, that's way better. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, sit down, Granny. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like some of, I feel actually that white South Africans in New Zealand have a bit of a reputation for being racist. racist. And I don't, I'm not necessarily saying that I subscribe to that, but I have experienced quite horrible run-ins with white South Africans mm -hmm. when, it, when working in hospitality, mm -hmm. treating me in funny ways and saying funny things to me. Obviously, this doesn't go for all white South Africans, mm -hmm. but in terms of that following them over, I think that reputation and that behaviour yeah. is known. I think um, also beyond just externally, the way they've internalised, like this family internalising that inequity mm -hmm. and to the point where Derek still refers to the white South Africans as expats. And we've all heard that language mm. of expats versus immigrants. Mm -hmm. Like if you Google the definition of expat versus migrant or immigrant, like even in the example that Google gives, it's like a British expat. 
and then it'll be like illegal immigrants. Oh, you know, like it's that's how ingrained it is. Even though the actual dictionary definition it's is the same. the same. Yeah. This next part, we get into Tammy and Tammy's gender and preferred pronouns. So, me and Julie are both cis women, and we use the pronouns she, her, hers. Cis means that we identify with the gender we were assigned with at birth. Yeah, cis stands for cisgender as opposed to transgender, where people may identify not as the gender they were assigned at birth or identify as gender diverse or non-binary. So Tammy identifies as non-binary, but also as a demigirl, and Tammy's preferred pronouns are they and them. I'm on the queer spectrum of um, non-binary. I do prefer they, them, singular, but I also am very accepting of she, her. But how hard would that be for yeah. you to incorporate well, talking and referring well, to me? Yeah, to be frank, I won't refer to you as they, them. I'll refer to you as Tammy. The term they, them would, would most probably take a long time for me to get used to because I'm not in that community. I'm not part of those conversations all the time. And this will sound very out there with my parents because I remember we had this talk about it when it came to my name change. That was the biggest discussion, wasn't it, Dad? Yep. And how, in the end, we just decided that it was okay for me just to be Tammy because I was happy with that. I felt that I found who I am in the name Tammy um, in terms of, like, Tammy is a creator. Tammy is an artist. and like All of these other things. Because I really kind of just yeah. sprung it on to you guys, yeah. didn't I? Well, yes, you you have done that. I mean, it was one of the most difficult conversations I've had with you. Yeah, I know, but I mean... But the fact that you guys, like, still... Want, I, I remember at the very end of it, like, at the end of the day, you just wanted me to be happy. Yes, at the end of the day, I wanted to be happy. It's a new... Like I explained to you, it was a new thing for me. I didn't expect you to identify as that. It was a bit of a, a shock to the system for me, and... And for your mom, I guess, as well. But at the end of the day, we have to uh, accept that. And because you're still our daughter, and you, we still love you as our daughter, no matter what. And for you, I mean, to, you had these other names that you, you, know, you felt very strongly you should change to. Um, it did hurt in a way, you know, and um, you know, I, it just was difficult to understand where that all came from. Tammy was married for five years. Tammy was engaged and married when they were quite young to a white man who cheated on and left Tammy for Tammy's best friend, who was a white woman. I didn't know at the time because I was, you know, a young teenager. I still remember very much the day when I moved out with him. I was 18 and you were so angry with me, Mom. I can never forget that. But dad was just sort of like calmly accepted it. Like, like this is just me wanting to just go out in the world. But that isn't everything. part of our culture. Part of our culture is that you would leave home when you get married. And we weren't dead. married by and then. And you were not married. I was engaged when I was, like, already so young. Um, this is just going to sound like a list of bad decisions, but I, I live with that now. <laughs> um, because... Um, In the end, you, my parents, were right in terms of all things that you feared around that everything. But, of course, I was a teenager. I had to go and rebel against that and had to go and find my own way and do my own thing. That was fine. And just marrying someone out of your culture, that's that's big. Yeah, and and, and it was hard to swallow. The dissolving of the marriage um, was that conflict Conflict. of culture so just you know Mm. to just like put it out there he went for a kiwi woman Mm. in the end Mm. um so it just sort of like that break and the support that 
you my parents had for me during all of that time, including afterwards when I was on my own again, and how you've just helped me get more and more back onto my feet and everything. It's and been, understanding who you are um, as yeah, Tammy. Exactly. Um, and I can't ask for better, better loving parents who have seen me be so happy and then me being on the worst days and having been beside me the whole time. Like when um, I had to like leave the house and come stay here um, when the marriage was breaking up and just things like that. At times, and as you know, during your um, stay or relationship with Thomas, um, I opposed lots of um, things in that relationship. It, it worried me that you were not really, you were trying to find yourself, but trying to correct me if I'm wrong, to ru- get a run away from your heritage, your South Africanism. You know, you're and not I'm wrong. Sure that was exactly it. That you had been influenced, you know, and saying, yeah. And I was always there protecting, always just wanting because I love you, because I care, always wanting to protect, and wanting you to know that it's inherent, it's in you. You are African. Your soul, your spirit inside you. Yeah, and I African. think I think your spirit was dampened. You were very outspoken. You you were you were not yourself anymore. Um, and and your mom knew that we knew that you, you know you couldn't express yourself. You will always be ma- uh, was made uh, feeling uh, that you're not capable of things to do. And we know you, when you you were always out there. You were always willing to do stuff. You can do things. But I think that the whole relationship or the influences that was around you it kept you from it. You always were made uh, feeling inadequate. Feeling- One of the most important things that went on with all of that was definitely my mental health. And from the outside, you guys could see that that marriage was doing the worst for my mental health. You saw me um, become someone who was incredibly anxious, who had these panic attacks, would then go into these depressive episodes where I wouldn't want to talk to anyone, um, didn't want to communicate with family or anything. Um, And I'll never forget that one night when we got inside and everything, I'll never forget when you said that (sighs) you were so scared that you would lose me because of everything that had happened to me and how I was feeling suicidal and I was feeling um, lost and alone and everything. But you wanted to be there and just it that moment really spoke to me in terms of like I, no matter what's going on in my head, I am loved and I am cared for and I have my family. It yeah. was very good to see that you being owning your own self again, being Thames, and that was very important to us to see. It was very really heartbreaking, sad to see you disintegrating um, because of someone else, and there was really nothing I could do but obviously um, be very vocal in my speaking with your ex, you know, and uh, being the horrible being... mother in law. <laughs> Going right. uh, and the father being the diplomatic. That was always my thing. You never forget where you come from. You mm-hmm. need to retain your culture. You need to, you are South African. You come from that soil, I always say. And I know that it really broke your guys' heart, like, you know, coming here, wanting happiness for, yes. like, all the children. Bringing you here for happiness and for opportunities and for growth. And then hearing, like, from me how much I, like, I wanted to end my life because everything was just going so 
terribly and cold and because because of you guys and going to the right people calling the right places going to the doctors and one of the biggest things that definitely helped was for you mom and dad to accept my mental health things to accept that this is something i'm going through yeah well we we we, be, we believe that it's important that you know as parents although you can be a hundred years old and if then you you're still our child our children will always be our children doesn't matter what the situation is we have to be there for you even if you live so you can be how old with kids we could have grandchildren, you will still be our child. That's why we keep that part. And our culture is our responsibility. That is our responsibility to care for you, you into this and world be that safety net you. for you. That's why we're there for you. Always. Mm-hmm. Always. So there was a last thing I wanted to say. Will, will you go live, will you go back to South Africa if you had a chance, if things were different? At this point, to live there, Mm. No, but I want to one day go back there when there's more peace. I want to be able to take people who are close to me and be able to go, this is where I come from and I am proud of it. I identify as a New Zealand citizen with South African heritage. Um, that's how I see myself. Even though like I call this home, I still, when talking with you guys, I say home as in South Africa too. I don't see myself as a Kiwi. I still see myself as a South African. Um, South Africa will still be home for me. Do you feel that way as well? Yes, I am a South African. I'll always be. I always belong to Africa. You can leave Africa, but Africa never leaves you. I always say that. Mm. Yeah. Great line. Beautiful last line. Yeah. Um, it's quite a hefty episode. Yeah, eh? it's one of our longest um, conversations that we recorded. I think there's so many complex things in there. Just South Africa as Mm. a place Mm -hmm. is very complicated. Um, The situation and relationship of being somebody who is non-binary and having immigrant parents is mm. kind of pretty naturally going to be something that it's a point is of complicated. Tension. Yeah. 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 Um, one thing I really admire or appreciate about Tammy is how willing to forgive or accept that their parents are going to struggle with uh, their identity. Mm. Like the fact that Derek and Lynette um, struggle to use the proper pronouns they, them, that can be really damaging to a lot of people who um, identify with pronouns that may not... Be the same ones their parents gave them. identify them with, yep. Um, so I think it takes a lot of empathy mm. to be willing to accept that your parents have done a lot for you. They've been through a lot of sacrifice themselves. Mm. Um, and to be able to appreciate all of that, even if you don't agree with what they do, you can see where they've come from and why they are the way that they are. Hmm. But I think there's also something really interesting here, which is to do with different generations judging each other's struggles or sometimes not being able to understand each other's struggles because they are so deep within their own. I mean, it's the same thing with feminism. Like white feminists in the 1960s find it hard to include they them pronouns in their language now I mean they go well I'm used to this I'm used to this political Mm -hmm. discussion and now you want me to do this as well but Mm -hmm. I spent so many years trying to do this yeah and it's like yeah well when you were spending years trying to do that people were trying to get there as well but they also had these other things that they were dealing with which is what intersectionality is I don't know it's hard to be like oh I think that one thing should be dealt with Yeah, and that's why it's so frustrating when you hear white women just talk about gender. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I think I also just wanted to shout out that if people are listening to this and they've been going through something similar with their family, that this is really hard and that we hope that... 
I don't, man, I don't know, man. I just hope it gets better. Yeah. Yeah. I guess also to acknowledge that as two cis women that we don't fully understand and mm. we'll never understand all the struggle that goes with being gender diverse, being trans. Um, we want to reiterate that trans women are women, trans men are men. Mm-hmm. If you're gender diverse, that's amazing. Mm. And, and valid. Um, all gender identities are valid. And we also just want to say thank you to the Solomons for being so generous with your stories and your time and allowing us to share some of these with a wider world. Mm. You can check out photos and videos of all our participants on Instagram at Combos with my, on Facebook at Where Are You From Really, and on RNZ's website. Conversations with My Immigrant Parents was created, produced, and directed by Julie Zhu and Saray De Silva. Recorded by Joey Siasoko, sound engineered by Colleen Brennan, with original music by Tal. Our cover illustration is by Ngaumutane Jones at Ms. Mimo, with design by Sonia Milford. RNZ supervising producers are Sarah Vuitalitu and Justin Gregory. RNZ senior commissioner on this project is Kay Almers. Conversations with My Immigrant Parents was made possible by the RNZ NZ On Air Innovation Fund. He kōnai ipurangi tēnei mō te reo irirangi o Aotearoa.